right, so Mark, your book is called On Snuff. It's coming out with Liverpool University Press very soon. Very soon. And we're, we're, we're going to be doing the dark materials today, yeah? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, that's my work. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about it. It's, uh, it's a time of year as well. It was Halloween last night uh, on the day of recording. It was Halloween, yeah. It was Halloween, yeah. Otherwise I was, yeah, otherwise I was seeing lots of uh, bad <laughs> things, yeah. So firstly, that's the question. Uh, so the book is on snuff and it's in the Devil Advocate series. Yes, the Devil's yeah. Advocates. Yeah, Devil's Advocates. Which yeah. is a pretty cool series with uh, LUP. And that series just talks about, it takes a particular movie and analyses the cultural impact and significance of it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly it. So it's a, it's a series uh, dedicated to, to horror films, essentially. And they've got, yeah, I, I don't know how many titles in the series now. It's grown all the time. I, I guess my book, Snuff, seemed like it would fit in that series really well. I get, but my book also takes a kind of bit of a departure in that it doesn't just look at the, the nature of Snuff movie. It doesn't just look at the film Snuff, it looks at the kind of cultural mythology of the Snuff film. Yeah, I think it fits well in the series, but it, it kind of also does some kind of different things, I think. So, well, let's start Yeah, let's start with the Snuff then. So why why the dark materials? What <laughs> draws you to this stuff? So, I can't be the first person who asked you that. No, and, and, I, and to be honest, I've kind of moved towards uh, um, other um, lighter, more airy Chirpier. stuff. Yeah, yeah. It kind of comes from my PhD. So my PhD was on um, on the video nasties, on the marketing and distribution of the video nasties. And my first book, Nasty Business, uh, looks specifically at that. And while I was doing the the PhD, an opportunity came up to to write an article on 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 the film Snuff, uh, specifically on the distribution of Snuff in the UK. So I, I wrote that article and. Uh, I always had a kind of a fascination with with the topic, really, with with the idea of how this how the idea kind of gets perpetuated through through popular culture and just kind of reverberates through culture. Um, so it, it's kind of an extension of my PhD, really. So um, snuff was video nasty in in the UK. Um, it was also controversial in other countries. This is um, snuff the movie you're talking. Snuff about. the movie, yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, and I guess we'll need some kind of negotiation as we go through or some kind of qualifying how we talk about this. Well, uh, let's let's do that. But that's uh, I read the book and it's very interesting. I, and people uh, should should when it comes out, uh, people should read it. Thanks for sending me an advanced copy. And it was I was like, well, I was there was there was philosophical implications to this it's very much about the question of truth the uh, how is it established what is the stuff what are the parameters of it what are the significance of the snuff movie in the technological age in the internet age we can talk about all of those things but let's start with the very very basics what is a snuff movie yeah so uh, what is a snuff movie not snuff the movie yes well th- this is not a straightforward question either really because um what is a snuff movie is as kind of has changed as as the language has become or as the kind of genre if you like has become kind of common knowledge so i think for a lot of people th- there's an assumption that a snuff movie is any movie that includes someone dying on camera and that is part of it but uh, when the idea of the snuff movie first first uh, emerged in the, the mid seventies in New York, the FBI were forced to, to try and kind of weird their way through uh, what was kind of coming up with a hundred years of cinema. Uh, and how do you uh, how do you navigate that? How do you negotiate this this kind of huge body of work? So they came up with very specific parameters about what what a snuff movie would look like. And for them, the the FBI definition is that it's a a visual depiction of murder uh, that can be either a a video or a a series of photographs. The imagery must have been produced to sexually arouse its intended audience. And the imagery must be commercially distributed for for financial gain. Those two clauses, those two sub-clauses, I think, complicate the idea of snuff, but, but also help us to disregard, for example, kind of sequences of the Holocaust, really kind of horrific sequences of, of murder, death and murder, but they wouldn't be seen as snuff films. Yeah, they wouldn't be categorised as as a snuff movie. Yeah, the, the FBI have this, this very kind of specific definition, and that's the kind of definition that I've worked from for the for the basis of the book. Because the the evolution, the idea that snuff is just something that uh, where, where anyone dies on camera is probably too messy. I think as a category. Yeah, and then there has to be the the key. I think the allure. Perhaps is a better way of thinking about the allure of the snuff movie or the snuff mythology is that it's the financial transaction that that, that, that somebody has somewhere has paid money for a murder to be organised on screen. Yeah, and that, that's that's certainly the, what you see repeatedly in films. So uh, 
There's a film called uh, Eight Millimeter. I don't know if you've come across that. Yeah, the Nicholas Cage. Yeah. Nicholas Cage. Yeah, um, where he's um, hired by someone who's come across what they believe to be a snuff film, and he has to go and, and kind of find out the, the veracity of that. Really, um, Hardcore is a, a similar film from the from the late seventies. Yeah, so th- this is kind of what you see repeatedly in in the kind of snuff mythology. This idea that someone is is commissioned to to produce a snuff film, and yeah, that satisfies the kind of sexual arousal component, but but also that it's, uh, I guess, a commercial product. Yeah, and that's the other thing I wanted to clarify. Then the question of sexual arousal does it count then as pornography? The snuff movie, if you know the ideal snuff movie, when the ideal necessary and sufficient conditions are met. Does it is it a part of that genre, or is that too capacious a definition of uh, pornography? It's certainly understood, uh, or certainly was understood, to be part of pornography. But um, it, it comes out uh, the, the, the the fictional film snuff, which kind of gives rise to the uh, popularity is probably the wrong word, but the, the the recognition of the category comes out in the mid seventies, just as the kind of radical feminist movement uh, 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 are beginning to establish themselves. There's a, a group called uh, Women Against Violence against women who are, are, are particularly interested in, in snuff firstly because they, they think that someone has actually died on camera but when it becomes clear that it was just a kind of fictional attempt it becomes uh, symbolic of violence against women of, of violence against women yeah and, and the fact that men could watch that and, and enjoy that violence against women is um uh, that that becomes a kind of motivating factor for the for the feminist movement at that point. So for them, it very much is an extension of pornography, uh, and it can be kind of categorised in that way, I guess. But um, I, I guess what we're talking about here is a largely fictitious car- uh, uh, genre, a, a category of film. It, it, the, there has never been a, a, a pseudo genre, you call it. Yeah, it, it's it's not not really a, it's not really it's a it's a pseudo genre of film. We all kind of understand what it is. But there's never been ever any evidence of the existence of of the snuff movie. There have been periodic scares, um, such as the during the video nasties moral panic. Again, that became a mobilising force for uh, for the Department of Public Prosecutions uh, uh, and the Conservative government at that time to rally around the, the supposed threat of video uh, because. People were apparently getting off on watching um, scenes of really people dying, but it, it was a fictional film that had, had been released in America in '76 and then released here in the UK in, in kind of '82. Right now, this is one of the things you talk about in the book. You clearly acknowledge that horrendous things exist on screen, also things that we have all probably seen. We've all seen people dying on screen. I think. I think probably the big example would be the footage of JFK getting shot. Yeah, that would have been millions of people have seen that. <laughs> probably millions of times now but that doesn't or we've seen i don't know we've seen um, we've seen animals die in apocalypse now we've seen I've, we've seen footage of footballers dying on on on, on the pitch yeah uh, we've seen all kinds of video nasties of people being decapitated and hanged and isis videos and all of these types of things they don't constitute snuff for you do you think uh, not going by the strict fbi yeah. uh, categorization they don't know they they they're of course hundreds of hours of footage of people dying on camera but they don't, don't meet those specific requirements of it being produced for financial gain and produced mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. To, to sexually arouse and it's partially because the, the majority of the, that kind of footage is is kind of newsreel footage that maybe is used maybe isn't used but certainly the GFK it, it, it's that kind of thing isn't it that gets circulated as as kind of news yeah so then you say as far as an epistemological question you talk about when you make that claim then the response to that tends to be one of yeah. just because we can't prove it doesn't mean it ain't there. Now, yeah. of course, you can't prove a negative, right? <laughs> yeah, or you yeah. can't disprove or prove it, a yeah. negative. But uh, that's what happens, isn't it? You say that uh, all of a sudden your position would be criticised by appeals to common sense. So the burden of proof is on the the sceptic of snuff <laughs> yeah. rather than the ones who claim it exists. Yeah, completely. Um, and, and that becomes um, one of the kind of underlying pieces of rhetoric from the from the feminist movement. And you think, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, in the, the very rational argument that they make that, that um, we know that men are capable of violence against women, um, why wouldn't they film that violence? Um, and why wouldn't they try and profit from that violence? So it, 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 there is a kind of logic to, to that argument, but it doesn't negate the fact that there has never been any evidence of um, of a an actual snuff movie. So then the, the next question <laughs> is you you get you're going to get accused of naivety then aren't you? <coughs> I guess so. Or not not necessarily you but uh, those who claim that okay 
this is a myth that this doesn't exist or if it does exist it doesn't meet the parameters that uh, of the of the FBI definition that you yeah. you 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 talk about yeah also i think why would you know i'm not a great one of life's great criminals but why would you film a crime it seems quite incriminating doesn't it you know? yeah. <laughs> it does yeah. bitch yeah yeah, how to get caught, um, 101. Yeah, I mean, and, and there is a kind of sense of that. But it always seems to come back to this kind of common sense because humans obviously have the capacity for, for rip and murder and, and quite heinous act. The, 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 the onus has always been on us, if you like, to, to challenge that and, and say, well, we have to prove that it doesn't exist where common sense dictates that it does exist, which is a, a kind of odd standpoint, I think. And it's because it's become so understood, I think, through popular culture. You know, my, my mum knows what a snuff movie is. It's just one of those terms. It's it's yeah. become part of the language. We sure we kind of understand what it is, and I think because of that kind of common sense, there's, a, there's, a, there's almost a kind of sense of, well, of, of course it must exist. Well, it's a very fatalistic view of humanity, isn't it? That yeah. uh, we do horrible things, which we do, yeah, no yeah. doubt. Without a doubt. And therefore... Obviously, we will do it on screen for money. Yeah. Or we will, someone will... There's a market for this stuff is the key, I think. Yes, yeah. Which, again, paints a pretty grim view of, of humanity. But but then the kind of is a market as well. And something I get to um, later on in the book is uh, a sense of the, the websites that appeared. I, I guess kind of um, late 90s, so websites like Ogreish and, and Rotten.com. And there's a handful of others. So these were, were kind of shock sites that became really popular. I don't know if you used to read a magazine called Bazaar. But I've heard it, of it. Yeah, in the back pages of Bazaar, which was a kind of... Pseudo kind of lads mag, but catering more to kind of alt culture. But F- of, FHM for the dark side. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, you really uh, genuinely was. And in the back of that, there were routinely adverts for, for websites like Rotten.com and Ogrish. And if you went to, to Rotten.com and Ogrish, what you'd, you'd find are shocking images and, and videos. A variety of different catering to a variety of different tastes. Um, but these videos tended to circulate as as kind of points of amusement which sounds kind of counterintuitive i think but there was always a sense that um images and videos of of death circulating online would be motivated by this kind of sexual impulse but but actually what was found was that the people who were circulating that stuff and were interested in that stuff did it almost as a kind of marker of of machismo it was this kind of performative masculinity and there's been some really interesting work done on that which i I kind of point to in the book these videos become kind of points of horrific amusement I think, uh, and the need of the circulation of those videos need to be understood in those terms. So, t- talking about the kind of ISIS videos and stuff like that, yeah, many of us. So the, the execution of Saddam Hussein is the one I saw. Yeah, and that was that was just I was like literally in a student chair, and someone was like, "Check this out!" Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I think there was a period where these things used to circulate more more kind of publicly than they do now. Perhaps I think a lot of the, the shock sites have been closed down or are kind of curtailed to some degree. Or maybe just the kind of interest in that has waned a little bit. The dark web. Yeah. I mean, that's what people keep pointing to. But a lot of this stuff that gets circulated wasn't on the dark web at all. Uh, and I think there's a whole other discussion, which I don't really kind of touch on in the book at all, but really feeds into the work around the video nasties, that what we're talking about are arguments that reinforce a sense that we need to control the internet. Or it was video back in the day, it's the internet now. These kind of narratives around snuff keeps in the dark web, the dark web. This stuff wasn't circulated on the dark web. This was just right there, the, right there on the web. You know, this this was just, and it wasn't shared for financial gain. It wasn't shared to se- sexually arouse. Just kind of dark curiosity, I guess. Probably some free speech advocates would probably think it should be out there as well. I would imagine. Yeah. 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 Now let's get into the weeds a bit, Mark, because we've talked about the, you know, the idea of the snuff movie. But I want to just talk to you a little bit. And we can come back to the, we'll, we'll have to keep coming back to that, I think, that anchor, is the 1976 film by uh, Michael and... Roberta Finlay. Yeah. Michael and Roberta Finlay, which started off as The Slaughter. Yes, yeah. And, and I think The Slaughter is a really interesting film. It's a really bad film, but it's a really <laughs> in, interesting film and, and a kind of important film. So Michael and Roberta Finlay had, had been kind of an exploitation kind of husband and wife team who'd um, produced a lot of work in a, another kind of pseudo genre known as The Ruffies. Um, the, the Ruffies are a particularly aggressive strain uh, of exploitation cinema. Um, 
um, that, that kind of applied violence and sadism to, to kind of the, the nudie cutie formula. So if you think of films like Russ Meyer, um, The Immoral Mr. T's, those kinds of early exploitation films, where you have this kind of inept male character and, and then the, these kind of buxom ladies um, for titillation. Um, and and the, the males are usually seen to be, as I say, kind of hapless and inept. That quickly evolves into into the roughies, which builds on that that nudie cutie formula, and that kind of routinely features stories that that uh, involve women being sold into slavery, uh, becoming hooked on drugs, and then later there are, there are kind of hardcore variations that invariably can conclude with the victims being forced to have sex with their kidnappers. Now, the early work by uh, Michael and Roberta Finlay really falls inside that, that genre, the roughies genre. So there's an emphasis on bondage, there's an emphasis on, on, on S&M, um, rough violence, sexual abuse, and that's where they, 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 they kind of take the name from. And they kind of make their breakthrough in 1964 with a film called Body of a Female, in which a, a stripper's abducted by a drifter and then d- delivered into bondage and tortured by a wealthy pervert, and it kind of feeds into that, that kind of snuff myth as well, I guess. Um, but they make a, f- a few sequels to that, or, or a few kind of follow-ups to that trilogy of films called uh, A Touch of Her Flesh, The Curse of Her Flesh, and The Kiss of Her Flesh. Uh, and then Michael wants to do something that's a, a bit more substantial, so he comes up with this idea for the slaughter. And this is just in the wake of the, the Manson murders. Um, yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, and th- this kind of really feeds directly into the snuff myth, I think. It's a, it's a, almost kind of accidental, but... Um, so so Michael makes this film the slaughter and uh, it, it's a it's a pretty bad exploitation film that, that has elements of a kind of easy rider um there's a girl biker gang that are are, are led by a, a, a supposedly charismatic uh, cult leader called Satan um Reed Satan um <laughs> subtle huh? yeah so and, and he is really kind of channeling this kind of Manson like figure What's the location? Uh, it was filmed in South America, so it's filmed in Argentina, uh, and that That's becomes right. very important to the to the snuff myth. So yeah, they, they they basically got together a lot of money from from doctors and dentists and whoever they could get to invest, and thought, well, film in South America that'll that'll be cheaper, so we'll we'll, we'll go down and do that. Why is this a pivotal moment? You think, Mark? Well, is it is it to do with the marketing? Because when you just when you in the book when you describe the end of it, I was like, oh, this sounds terrible, but yeah. like, you know, and is is the marketing kind of that they were kind of hinting that. Actually, this was a real murder on screen, or did it get taken up like that? Is that right? Well, the, the, yeah. The the conclusion to uh, to the slaughter um, sees the gang basically stab a, a pregnant woman. So again, kind of nods to the Sharon Tate murder. But I, I think be, perhaps because of that, perhaps just because of the allusions to the to, to the Manson murders, it didn't get any distribution at all. Um, so there are different takes on this. Some people say it was it was rarely seen. Some people say it was never seen. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the camp that believes it was never seen, really. And it sat on the shelf for years, gathering dust, until a, a producer in New York... Alan, Alan Shackleton. Alan Shackleton, yeah. So he'd been a kind of porn producer. Um, he'd commissioned some films uh, with Roberta Finlay earlier. And... Michael, uh, unbeknownst to, to Roberta, actually sells uh, the slaughter, and, and he tacks on the ending that was w- what becomes known as the kind of snuff. Gotcha. Ending. So, towards the end of the film, where we've got the what seems to be the last scene of the slaughter, and then the camera kind of jumps back, and we're we're on set, uh, and we're presented with a film crew essentially filming the scene sequence that we've just watched. Uh, a poor approximation of that scene, I have to say, it doesn't really kind of match up. But from there, you yeah, you get kind of um, there's a woman on set and a guy who believes the director uh, who's become aroused by what he's seen on on screen and he uh, sits down with with the woman and um, essentially kind of forces himself on her and the camera crew come in. Um, she's receptive initially and then when she sees the camera crew becomes quite scared. He then pulls uh, a knife out, cuts her fingers off, cuts her neck, I believe, and then stabs her in the stomach and and essentially disembowels her something that plays out as incredibly com- comedic um you'll have to take my word for it if you haven't seen I it think but so. well when i when i was reading it it was and i looked at you had some of the stills in the in, in the mm. book but you did you, you yeah, the description you outlined there was pretty horrific but actually when you look at it like it looks quite cheap it doesn't look scary it's like it's kind of like high gothic melodrama more yeah. than anything yeah, and, and you can see the kind of prosthetic hand is losing its shape and kind of buckling the angle that um the, the kind of uh, the woman's body is at never sits right so it, you can tell it's a kind of fake torso uh, that, that's been kind of eviscerated 
and it's yeah it's just not very convincing really but the distributor this alan shackleton uh, chap he's clearly someone who understands the power of taboo you know the, or the appeal of taboo well in a basic every day since the you know the, the the urge to watch the 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 car crash on the on the motorway like you know yeah. that 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 allure and appeal that you get with these dark topics but what interested in me is this Shackleton character is, he's clearly a bit of a charlatan is it he like I have a quote here I think is it so you said when, so this Shackleton this distributor of what became Snuff he was challenged over the authenticity of the film he concedes that if he con- he says if he, con- if he conceded that it did indeed depict a real murder he said he would be in jail in two minutes but it's a great but that <laughs> He also says that if it wasn't real, he would be a damn fool to admit it. Indeed, right, right. So it's it's all about uh, it's all about marketing. He, he strikes me like well, what makes the myth? That's what I'm interested about. This mm. what makes the myth of of snuff what it is is this kind of Barnum and Bailey figure. It's one of the great promotional campaigns. It strikes me as one of the great promotional campaigns in the history of cinema of all time, without yeah. doubt. Up yeah. the, like I was, I was, I, yeah, I was saying, he was up there with like uh, you know David O. Selznick's Search for Scarlet yeah. or. You know the Blair Witch uh, project. Yeah. You know the found footage idea. Yeah, I think that was. It was like this guy just would like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he knew. He knew the appeal that this would have. Yeah, a real kind of genius with it actually, and, <laughs> yeah. um, and it doesn't land immediately, which I thought was the interesting thing. So um, a lot of the kind of histories begin in New York and the release of the film, um, but actually it played in a couple of other cities before then, and it just never got the traction that it needed. And he he essentially planted protesters out, outside the theatre oh, to drum clever, up publicity, yeah. and then that soon attracted uh, the, the kind of ire of the feminist groups, so, so they're joined by his planted protesters. And then they are joined by an unlikely ally in the in the porn industry who felt that what he was presenting wasn't pornography and it kind of muddied their good name. It wasn't pure enough, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, so that is quite the unholy alliance. You have an unholy alliance there of Christian fundamentalists, feminists and pornographers protesting this movie simultaneously. Yeah. And this is kind of like the Catholic Church banning movies, isn't it? Like It's like nothing... Nothing says <laughs> watch a movie more than a, a bunch of people saying you can't watch this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it always kind of makes me think of that Father Ted sequence, you know, that okay, now now down with that uh, that sort of thing. But it's yeah, it really is a kind of a masterstroke. He doesn't get enough credit, I don't think, for because what he's essentially done is is give credence to a myth that we're still talking about now, and, and we're not talking about it because of the film, but but the film kind of spread the belief in the myth I think so the, the perpetuation the reverberation of that myth through culture is it's interesting, partly because of it? that film yeah you can you don't that's it's almost like he calls it being the the purpose of film and it's it's, it's, it's probably there's some technological issues here as well because this is a pre um, there's some technological issues here as well isn't there Mark because this is pre VHS am I right in saying that yeah yeah so this is 76 right so this is not easy to film. You know, it's, it's hard to get film. Film film itself is, is footage. This is like pre-digital. Yeah. You know, you can't do this on a computer. Yeah. Sound and audio are probably not recorded at the same time. Am I right? Um, I'm not sure for this film. I mean, I, I, I would assume that it was sort of recorded in sync, but that's certainly one of the things that they, um, they play with uh, in the conclusion to Snuff. So... What we get is uh, wh- when they've killed the, the woman in the in the uh, the added conclusion, we hear someone. We hear the we hear the footage run through the shutter, uh, uh, the, the the film run through the shutter. Sorry, no credits, no credits, uh, and we hear the, hear them say, "Did you get it? Yeah, I got it." Um, so this idea that it's not post, uh, it's it's post synchronized sound, and they're, they're shooting this separately. Except that goes against what you're kind of seeing on the screen as well. So they, they, they play with our ideas of uh, and our understanding of film, and I think that is really is a masterstroke. Not having any credits, so we hear the the film run through the shutter. It's almost Brechtian, yeah. Yeah, and it, there's just this kind of this suspicion, I guess, that you're left with that. Was that real? Is that what I've just? Because we're so used to the, the kind of conventional apparatus of cinema. Um, well, it's it's the exact limits of the cinema. The, the the it's the exact limits of the film of what a film is, because we know when we go to a film, all things being equal, we know it's we go to it because it's not real. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, when you you kind of there's something shocking about that because it breaks down the boundary. The, it breaks down the fourth wall into theatrical terms, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it breaks down the uh, the sense that 
actually I'm participating in this I've just paid money to come in and watch this I'm complicit in this movie yeah. I'm to blame. That's what we don't like about it. So then you kind of go, ooh, am I to blame? Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to watch this? Do I need yeah. to look up to this? Are we the deviants that the, the snuff myth speaks of? You know? Yeah, it, yeah. It does. It makes you complicit, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, except it, it would make you complicit were it not so poorly done. <laughs> but in fact, it's not a snuff movie, clearly. Yeah. Or yeah. by the FBI's <laughs> director of it. Yeah. Now, around about the time, I'm so I'm interested in the origin of how myths form. That's, and this guy has clearly got a got a sense on how uh, how to market taboo subjects, mm. right? Now the um, at the same time, round about the same time, the the Manson family get mixed up in this. There's a myth that that the murder, I guess, of Sharon Tate is actually, in fact, has been filmed, and yeah. that there is there's this film is in existence somewhere, or is hidden on Charles Manson's uh, compound in. LA, I would believe, believe it would be. Yeah. So he, he, that then, at the same time, kind of overlaps with it, or the origin of the myth, that the Manson material has also um, contributed to the to the to the perpetuation of the myth of snuff. Yeah, um, it, it really is odd. I mean, I, I, as I say, the, the 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 narrative of the slaughter kind of has has these allusions to the Manson family. So there's a, a book that comes out by a, 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 a it was a musician and poet, I believe, a guy called Ed Sanders, and the book's called The Family: The Story of the Manson Family's June Buggy Attack Battalion, and. There's a series of interviews that Ed Sanders conducted with kind of peripheral members of the family or people who had a kind of passing association with the Manson family. And I've got to say, his uh, interview technique leaves a lot to be desired. He kind of leads them to, to, to the answers that he wants, essentially. So there's there, there, a lot of discussion about were you present when uh, people were filmed, um, and what, what kind of things were filmed. <laughs> Did you did you film on a, on a full moon? <laughs> did you did you see kind of films of murder? Did you see werewolves? Yeah, yeah. It's it's that kind of line of questioning, and and he basically gets the results that he wants. So one of the replies, if I remember rightly, is uh, a response that was yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. I think is what he's what one of the respondents says. So he's clearly been led by Sanders' belief that the family filmed murders. Now the family did film lots of stuff and there's there's lots of documentaries actually comprised from footage that the, the Manson family made using 8mm cameras but they were also rumoured to have stolen a, an NBC a kind of production quality van so the idea that they shot with that stuff as well but there's there's never been any evidence that they, they filmed the, the murders of Sharon Tate now I think what blurs this is that we're so familiar with those pictures of, of Sharon Tate um, the murder of Sharon Tate but those are the crime scene photos um, so you end up with this kind of layer, and so we're talking about the evolution of myth and how myth gets perpetuated. You've got this film, The Slaughter, that trades on the idea of the Manson family. You've got this this guy, Ed Sanders, who tells us that uh, the Manson family filmed their murders, and then you've got the crime scene photos that, that, that reproduce the, 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 that idea of, uh, of, of snuff. And I think the layering of those things over time just starts to be conflated in people's minds and, and there's a sense of, yeah, of course the Manson family would have done that. Same th- thing that you were talking about at the beginning, you know, the idea that they're capable of that type of stuff. Of course, yeah. That, what that's interests me about it, in all of this, it's hard to disprove a negative and I'm going to talk about other things momentarily, other examples of potential snuff movies, which you talk about in the book as well. But there seems to me to be this desire to keep the myth alive you know, that in some way we want it to be true. We want to imagine that there are rare occurrences of this, but it does, in fact, happen. Mm. It's almost a way of keeping ourselves safe, isn't it? That we say that, yeah, this that could happen. That could definitely happen. It's rare, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> it's there, definitely. Even if we haven't got a direct evidence of one. But what do you think it is? What is that desire? <laughs> why do we? Why? Why is it we keep that? What is that desire to keep the myth alive? Is that? Is that part of it? Do you think? It, it must be. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not something I really kind of explore in detail. But but yeah, the, the, it, it's kind of like the X Files, isn't it? We want to believe. Uh, the truth is out there. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think because the, you know, as humans, we have the capacity for the most horrendous crimes. But it always comes to me. It always comes back to the idea of well. 
you'd have to be a lunatic to arguably these people are but but to film yourself doing something like that is perhaps the most incriminating act you would ever want to do and most of us care too much about our freedom to to do that i guess i think part of the reason that it survives the the myth perpetuates and, and not just survives it thrives really is the 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 use that that idea has served for for various kind of feminist groups who were who were protesting against mistreatment from men so routinely what you'll see and I, and I document some of this in in the book is some horrendous crimes uh, that have been committed that are then referred to as snuff movies or, or, or claims that snuff movie uh, snuff was the the focus for the production of these images or, or videos and often there's no evidence of images or videos it's just this, this kind of sense of well that must be the reason for this another aspect that i want to talk about it particularly with the slaughter that became snuff there's always a, a kind of foreignness to these movies that there's the location for snuff or for the slaughter was Somewhere, somewhere exotic. Yeah. Somewhere out there. I can't remember quite what the tagline was. Uh, made in South America, where life is cheap. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like it's, it's well, it's basic colonialism. Yeah, it? yeah. Or, it really or cultu- is. Uh, yeah, cultural colonialism. Uh, so that, that sense there that is never here. It's arriving in the country from elsewhere. A bit mm. like yeah, like <laughs> like like Dracula in the yeah. novel. You know, he, gave, yeah. he doesn't come from uh, doesn't come from Stoke or Manchester yeah. or anywhere like that. He comes from somewhere weird and strange where they do strange things. It is that kind of gothic tradition, isn't it? But but explicitly linked to that colonialism, as you say. So in North America, the threat was always coming from South America. In the UK, the threat was coming from California, and there's a kind of sense of the family which keeps getting repeated. Also, well, liberal, permissive California. That and the kind of Manson family link I think you know so the, the, there's the, those things tied together but also uh, the suggestion that uh, th- th- these films were been imported from Amsterdam you know the city of sin of course but you're right there is always this this otherness it's, it's never us it's never us internally in our society it's coming from elsewhere yeah my neighbour wouldn't like do this yeah yeah might do that <laughs> yeah and I think that was part of the, the, the genius of of Shackle. And again, the, the idea to tack on um, this this kind of fictional ending is one part of a, a strategy. Um, and the other part is to to promote it as seem kind of uh, real death on screen. So that yeah, so there, there are two well, kind of three taglines to the to the film snuff. So the the first is the film that could only be made in South America where life is cheap. So obviously capitalising on that. Uh, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but Shackleton gets this idea because there are news reports coming out in in, in kind of 75, 76 uh, in New York that that films featuring real death have been imported from from South America and he's you know this kind of uh, light bulb moment where he thinks oh, I can capitalise on that I've got this film on the shelves I can just tack an ending onto that so he takes that idea um, and, and see an, an idea that had gained a lot of uh, a lot of press and, and then releases this film so the, the film that could only be made in South America where life is cheap capitalising on that it, it also claimed to be the bloodiest thing that had ever happened in front of a camera and the picture that they said could never be shown and uh, think who were there and uh, you know, <laughs> it, it kind of pl- I guess just plays all of the the kind of exploitation trump cards that you would expect. It's it's how do you get bums on seats? Of course. Now speaking of getting bums on seats, the feminist movement or some feminists directly contributed to that, as you said, and as well, you know that that otherness that we've been talking about about the snuff movie that it's exotic, it's taboo, it's uh, it's a prohibition and therefore is enticing. Feminism. Or some feminism, uh, and we can talk about specific feminists here actually, because we mentioned the the unholy alliance of the pornographer, mm. the Christian fundamentalists, and uh, the feminists. Some feminists have a very tortured relationship to this material. So in the book, you talk about people like uh, Andrea Andrea Dworkin, the Irish feminist uh, Claude Corcoran, mm-hmm. and uh, you talk about. Uh, Polly Toynbee mm-hmm. as well. Her work, she, uh, she Polly Toynbee contributed to the was it a government body, uh, the Williams Committee report, yeah, the Williams Committee. Bernard Williams, mm-hmm. the philosopher, yeah, which was a a report on censorship, really, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think I want to be clear. I have no kind of um, vested kind of interest in, in in discrediting any any of these people, but I think the, the Toynbee report was uh, her contributions to the report were, were very interesting because she was reported in, in the press uh, as talking about some really quite kind of horrific sequences. But it turns out, if you go back to the Williams report, that a lot of this stuff came from two or three a day three, two or three day meeting session that they'd had with the BBFC. So these were fictional 
films. These were uh, w- which are then conflated into the snuff myth. That's the conflation is interesting. How does that conflation happen? Why does that happen? Do you think? Because, sorry, just before you go on, Mark, the argument was that a lot of these feminists were making, and now I'm not again, I'm not having a go at feminist cause, but in this particular instance, the claim seemed to be made that that snuff movies was was cheap, it was common, it was readily available, there was an under the counter market for it, uh, and in a sense, it was moral panic stuff, was it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, in many ways, snuff is the the quintessential moral panic. I think the the, the belief that that someone out there would would kill you on camera for for kind of sexual pleasure. Yeah, it, it's complex. I think, and again, it comes back to that idea of what is the appeal of uh, of this type of work. Now, we, we if we're talking about the film snuff, it's an exploitation film. It's a fictional film. It's a, it's a, piece it's a horror of, movie. It's a horror movie. Piece yeah. of art, yeah. And I think what what becomes very interesting around the feminist movement protests against this is a kind of generic confusion which is uh, what Linda Williams calls it um, so Linda Williams is uh, she's a, a very famous uh, scholar and her work particularly around around snuff is hugely important because she talks about the the the, the, the conflation between essentially hardcore pornography uh, and where the where the culmination is is the orgasm and and horror cinema essentially where the, where the, I guess the culmination would be would be death, and this she talks about as a kind of uh, orgasmic uh, the ultimate orgasm I think is, is the, the way that she frames it, um, and and that idea is taken up by scholars like um, Enya Johnson and, and Eric Schaefer who suggest that the the shift in discourse was was. Um, strategically deployed by the feminist movement, really. So the, the idea that snuff stands at a, at a pivotal moment uh, in, in shifts about um, pornographic representations. So you've got to understand this in the context of the time, I think. So 1975 is, is the kind of high point of, of, of what was called porno chic, so uh, what's kind of seen as the golden age of pornography now. Yeah, Ralph Blumenthal, from the uh, journalist for the New York Times, coined, coined the term Porno chic, and that was to. It was in response to a, a series of, of really high-profile porn films. Most notably, probably Deep Throat is the one that, that, that everyone's heard of. But but equally, yeah, Blumenthal referred to to Deep Throat as the the Ben Hur of porno pics. Indeed, but, but this comes at a re- really interesting moment for porn. You know, um, you get a lot of kind of interesting work being done, interesting ideas being expressed through through the genre. So you get a film like The Devil in Miss Jones, which is um, essentially a pornographic adaptation of, of Jean-Paul Sartre's play Huy Clos. It's existentialist pornographic filmmaking. Um, You've, my eyes are open. I was not aware. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the opening of Misty Beethoven. Uh, so that's that's based on uh, George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. So I, I see that's a really interesting time for pornographic production. And Shackleton had been involved in, in that work, at least in the distribution and, and, and some to some some degree production. But he senses that the market changing, that there's beginning to be a bit of a backlash, that, that uh, the feminist movement's starting to grow and build. And that's, ironically, why he decides to move towards producing snuff. He, he thinks that would be a safer bet. And he tries to get people involved in the porn industry and they were like, are you crazy? You can't, you can't do this film. You know, this is, this is not going to land well. Um, but it, as I say, it becomes a really kind of pivotal moment in, in, in shifts about representation. So Enya Johnson and Eric Schaefer argue that before Snuff, pornography had, had been viewed generally as a kind of victimless vice, really. Sometimes kind of more controversially as, as an expression of sexual liberation. But after the release of, of Snuff, attitudes become far more conservative very quickly. And, and porn becomes re-stigmatised as, as a... It's a, really a kind of dangerous form of, of low culture that legitimises the, the exploitation of women and children. And, and you can see where snuff starts to feed into those narratives. Very important film from that, for, despite... Um, I, I, I'd be interested how many of your viewers have actually seen it, because it isn't really widely circulated, but, uh, but the idea... The idea it, yeah. has circulated massively, yeah. yeah. And maybe that's a good place to segue into the discussion of the afterlife of snuff, which is a considerable part of the book, yeah. is you talking about this snuff movie, this particular horror movie, I think is a horror genre, really, isn't it? Or it's a sl- sort of Exploitation slasher. film, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Edelstein, in a famous New York Times magazine, they talk about how, well, obviously not the snuff movie, but how the snuff aesthetic gets taken up and 
Edelstein argues in that New York Times uh, article, Edelstein argues that this was a new, there was a new wave of uh, horror films in the early 2000s, what he called uh, quite strikingly torture porn. Yeah. Uh, a category in which he includes Hostel, The Devil's Rejects, Saw, the Saw series, yeah. Wolf Creek and The Passion of the Christ. Yeah. Yeah, interesting that that film is uh, routinely kind of included in in those lists um, of torture porn. Yeah, of torture porn. Yeah, I mean that 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 scene is is quite horrific, and you do wonder had it not been a depiction of Christ, that w- whether they would have gotten away with it in quite the same way. I, I don't know. Um, so I suppose the the question is in is what, how does in what ways in subtle ways is is that original movie feeding into this into these more contemporary trends? It's something that never really goes away. So as I say, um, hardcore in I think it's seventy nine or eighty. Um, repeats those ideas 8mm in the 90s uh, probably the biggest one that has has a huge legacy is a film called Cannibal Holocaust which uses this kind of found footage trope which then gets adapted into famously into the Blair Witch these kind of kernels of elements of the snuff myth I think play into all of these uh, the narratives and then then along comes along comes the internet yeah. So I mean, we didn't even really get. I mean, that's one of your sort of specialties, the sort of videos, VHS nasties, and stuff like that, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's like that, that takes up the eighties. Yeah. Know? I mean, I'm interested in distribution in in kind of all its forms. I think distribution and um, distribution and circulation. I think cause there's, a, there's a distinction to be made there. Go uh, on. Dis- so what's that? I think distribution as the the, the kind of official. Uh, transmission of material, I guess. Circulation as something that that is is probably less less official that, that that just kind of circulates online yeah or even in the 80s it was a case of you know somebody on the hand videos yeah 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 people just record yeah. and just pass it on like or the same with music mm. isn't it like yeah. you know and certainly that's why the, the 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 snuff movie the idea of the snuff movie doesn't go away in the 80s because um as a distributor w- was slated to release it uh and then we're told no one in terms that if they did uh, they would be prosecuted uh, and then the film then kind of comes to the shell doesn't have a distributor's label on it uh, it has no uh, link to who might have put it out now arguably the only people who stand to benefit from something like that is the distributor who uh, intended to put it out in the first place uh, but they always denied any association but from that you get various kind of moral campaigners so um, Mary Whitehouse here becoming bent out of shape about this idea of, of the snuff movie when it was just the same fictional movie that had been greeted by protest in 76 in New York, but had subsequently been proved to just to be a fictional film. Then, in the late... Well, we talked about the early 2000s. Let's talk about the late 2000s. A lot of cases you touch on in the book. You talk about the case of Julie Bindel. Julie Bindel published an article in The Independent about the this horrific murder of a Swedish journalist, Kim Wall. Yeah. And that was attributed to the apparent pervasiveness of snuff movies yeah. you talk about uh, the Dnipro murders in the Ukraine uh, which was the murder and filming of an elderly man and yeah, the circulation yeah. of it on well what struck, what struck me about that was interesting that was bad that was, yeah, it was yeah, really, really, really really horrific crimes really yeah. horrific crimes it caused a panic in the city of Dnipro yeah. and it was circulated on the internet and what struck me about the book was the these hardcore thrill seekers I, I guess or maybe not thrill seekers is the right word but hardcore video nasty aficionados connoisseurs if you will they saw this and they were like oh I don't know about that now that was a bit far for, even for me you yeah. know yeah, I mean, that from um, some work in a book called Killing for Culture, and they, they kind of trolled a lot of these forums. And what they found is that the people were, even the people that were actively seeking this out, so as I talked earlier about the the, the, the websites like Ogrish and Rotten.com, so the people who were kind of going to these places uh, and kind of saying, come on, kind of see if you can kind of scare me or disgust me or whatever it might be. Yeah, it, it was seen as a step too far for, for them. Even. The, it's Julie Wall, isn't it? Julie Bindell and Kim Wall, I think. Kim Wall, what... sorry, yeah. yeah. The, the Kim Wall murder is interesting because, because when, when they looked at his uh, internet history, he'd been looking, at, looking for videos of, of decapitated girls and, uh, and this, that and the other. So the, her murder is then attributed to, to snuff but there was no evidence that he ever filmed it. And again, uh, Julie Bendel points back to a supposed screening that took place in, in the early 80s. Uh, and the language that she uses to describe that is directly from um, the Polly Tomby article. So these things... Feed into each other. They feed into each other, yeah. It just, it, it becomes, it's almost kind of, it's tabloid gossip, you know, that, that just gets circulated. Has 
in your view, the internet accelerated or amplified the reception of this myth? I guess I know the answer to that question already. Yeah, I, I, it's definitely changed our relationship to film. It's democratised film production. It's democratised film uh, distribution. And with that becomes the in, the increased likelihood that we're going to um, certainly experience some kind of snuff film. And, and I, I, we can talk about this at, at length, but and I do kind of touch on it in the book, the sense that we may have already been witness to, to what is arguably the first snuff movie, but we need to expand our parameters of what we think of as as snuff. Right. But certainly, in terms of what we think of as profit and from snuff. Right, and that's sort of the argument of the of the book, isn't it? That's you're you're at the end of the book. You're making a claim that the FBI definition doesn't really work anymore, does it? Yeah. Or is it too limited, or is too precise, perhaps? Um, I, I don't know if it's too precise. It, it's. <sighs> It was made for a very specific time, uh, and I think the the economics and the shape of the industry has changed so much, and the shape of society and culture generally has, has changed so much that it didn't really account for for the internet. Really, I don't, I don't think it, it really. How could it in 1976 predict what was going to happen? Now, one case that you spend some time with in the book on the internet is the Luca Magnotti case. Yeah, anyone who's listening will probably be familiar with the story from the Netflix documentary which came out last year or the year before called uh, Don't Fuck With Cats. Don't Fuck With Cats, yeah. And that's about a a video by Luca Magnotti, or, which is not actually the real name, but uh, Luca Magnotti films a video killing a cat and kind of does a catch me if you can uh, yeah. thing. And then internet sleuths pursue him and that's what the documentary is about, pursuing this guy. And his he uh, escalates the until he actually kills someone. So, uh, do you, could you perhaps talk about the significance of that within the context of the book? Yeah, I, I spend a long time in the book uh, uh, kind of claiming that, that snuff doesn't exist and there's never been any evidence for it. And I think by the uh, the original FBI definition, uh, there, there still isn't. Uh, I don't think there are any cases that really fall in, into that category. But the um, the Luca Minotta murder uh, of John Lynn really does begin to, I guess, address some of the differences in, in our society today from when the FBI first coined that um, that definition. Now, for me, I mean, if if you if you are familiar with this case, you know how kind of horrific it is. So he he, he produces a series of videos. Uh, bath time lol, I believe, is one where he, he drowns a, a cat in the bath. There's another one where he, he uh, uses a, a vacuum cleaner to, to suck the air out of a bag and, and kill another cat. And then another one where he, he pays, uh, feeds another cat to a python. And th- there's a there's a huge groundswell, as you would expect, and people wanting to, to try and stop this, and people claiming that if we learn anything from serial killers in the past, that they, they tend to start with animals and, and work up. And McNutt act- actively uses that as a kind of threat uh, and, and says that he will be escalating his crimes. And he does. And he does, yeah. To, the, to, to a real murder. Yeah. Which uh, is filmed and circulated. Yes, um, so he films uh, the, the murder of uh, of John Lynn. It is uh, a horrific piece of film, and he then uploads it to the internet. And this kind of goes against what we were talking about earlier. Saying why would you do that? Yeah, uh, and I think what you need to under- understand about Luca Magnotta is he was desperate to be famous. His uh, earlier life had all been around failed attempts to become a celebrity and whatever where that might be and it never quite panned out for him. Um, yeah, so the Luca Magnotti is actually a, a, a character effectively Yeah, fueled by sock puppet accounts on Facebook yeah. and uh, fake Instagram accounts and uh, quite often he'd be in order to make himself famous he'd be commentating on his own uh, yeah. accounts and in order to get hits and clicks and the like. Yeah, it, it, interacting with himself basically o- online trying to drive traffic to, to his various uh, sock puppet accounts and to his, his YouTube accounts and he'd make kind of claims um, that, that he was involved with Madonna, that, that he'd been arrested, breaking into um, Area 51, and yeah, just, just I think he says that he was related, I think Michael Jackson says that he was related to, to Russian royalty and Russian gangsters, just really odd bizarre stories, but all all trying to kind of direct attention. And he culminates in the in making this 
in this murder this film. video. Yeah, and uh, the reason that I I think the the original FBI definition of uh, of what constitutes a snuff movie should be extended because it's this idea of commercially distributed for financial gain. Right. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Mark. That's what struck me about that is that the FBI definition, while useful, it also calls it into being. I suppose, but that's another. Uh, point with the FBI definition is a precise definition but sort of discursively it is a bit compact because and I think that's why I wanted to talk to you about the question of profit. Profit doesn't necessarily need to be linked to fiat currency or a, transa- or a, you know, or a money mm-hmm. transaction. This guy Luca Magnotti, I can't even remember what his uh, original name was. You know I can't, no. Yeah. But the uh, the the point being that he certainly profited from it spiritually, in terms of career, uh, in terms of notoriety, yeah. and in terms of the fame he so desperately craved. Yeah. That is, to my mind, profit, if not necessarily financial profit. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's what needs to be understood about that case is that he wasn't interested in in money. He wanted to be famous. He desperately needed to be famous. And on the back of these crimes, he becomes famous. And you're right, that is profit. We're making him famous now. Yeah, yeah, and and we will continue to do that, you know. Uh, He is uh, one, effectively, which is terrifying. So does that video then count as a snuff movie within an extended definition, do you think? That's the argument I try to make, um, and I'm I'm still uh, you know in two minds about this, but because I think you st- when you start to break down those boundaries, where where does it end? You you need some kind of terminological precision, don't you? But but I think you're right. There was definitely profit there. While I don't think it was necessarily produced to sexually arouse its audience, he is certainly sexually aroused in the in the sequence. Um, so th- there is there there's a sexual component. Yeah, and through the monetization of it, I suppose he's also. Also, those who were the internet sleuths who sought him out were also excited and thrilled by the chase of mm. this character. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, he he just really embraces the um, I guess the possibilities of of that kind of notoriety, and that feels like something that the FBI definition just co- it couldn't account for. The way we engage with media, the way we've all become producers, prosumers, I guess is how we would talk. Prosumer, that's. Uh, horrifically scary word Mark what does that mean it's a, well, producer, producer a, consumer producer consumer yeah and that's all of us now isn't it we all produce our own media we all consume we're all broadcasters yeah, yeah. You, I think the book ends on a bit slightly bleak note I felt I felt at least when I got to the end of it because your conclusion was that we have and it falls on from you just exactly what you're saying that we're prosumers that we have become our at the very least we're becoming more and more accustomed to desensitization to becoming exposed to extreme imagery and that because of that we are actually in fact becoming more and more complicit in making this internet snuff internet more and more likely yeah was is that a fair appraise of your conclusion i guess so i mean it's, it's difficult to have an upbeat conclusion to a book like this really um but uh the the that partially comes from some work in in, in South America. So there's a magazine, uh, Chronica, who had documented the, 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 the death of a model and essentially photographed her, her naked body. And that, that was on the, the kind of cover of the magazine and, 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 and kind of centre spreads. Now, this is a magazine that glamorises and sexualises um, women routinely. And then you've got this, which they're, they're profiting from. It's arguably intended... So decline and fall, uh, sort of a rise and fall, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, it's that kind of, yeah, schadenfreude, I guess, is that... Sounds like the Mail Online as well, Yeah, 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 and uh, it really feels like... But you... to be fair to the Mail Online, Dad, I don't think they've brought <laughs> those dead bodies yet. From those deaths, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, how long, yeah... I just, I mean, that was very specific. There were a number of cases in arising from South America, which feels awful because you talk about this idea of where the myth comes from and this this idea of a film that could only be made in South America where life is cheap. But actually, if you you see um, what some of the media is doing in South America and uh, stuff like this, it it has kind of been proven to be true. Yeah, narco drug videos and things like that where, you know, they sort of film their, their kills. Not too dissimilar to ISIS videos as well, I think. Yeah. But of course, the idea that we can think of ISIS videos or ISIS members as rabid, other, stupid is very myopic, really, isn't mm. it? Because they're very technologically savvy. Yeah, they're yeah. very modern. It's sort of a modern nihilism, I think, those type of... Uh, there we go. That's that's the next title for the next book, Modern yeah. Nihilism. Yeah, it's a, it's a di- like I say, it's difficult to come up with a, a, a kind of um, a positive conclusion. Well, I've got an idea. Was one of the things that struck me, right... 
because I read this and you know when you when you read a book you you talk about a lot of different cases mm. very well written Mark very clear and I was one like oh that's an interesting case and I looked up that and then I looked up another case and I was like um, you know after a couple of hours of this I was you not starting to feel down and yeah. <laughs> tired I want my blankie yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I wanted to get, like <laughs> wrap up with a nice wug of, wug, mug of warm cream yeah, yeah. and like you know comfort myself but uh, just doing this type of research and what I want to ask is what is it like doing this if that's just me reading it and like you know going down a few sort of internet rabbit holes going, and they're never far away those internet rabbit, rabbit holes what is it like doing that what's it like for you you know these are dark topics like you're, you're, what are you going to look at here your murder incest sexual violence paedophilia how do you compartmentalise that's my question yeah when uh, you're doing the research yeah it, uh, you're right it, it is a, a very difficult area to work in and that's probably the reason that my next book is about surfing uh, <laughs> very chirpy yeah, yeah. I, thought, I don't know the Beach Boys some dark stuff <laughs> some in that dark. music yeah. there's always a link back to the Manson family of course oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah I, I kind of post this because I've done the video nasties book which is very much about marketing and branding so it's it's not kind of interested in um, ideas of uh uh, exploring the moral panic t- to any huge degree it's it's really interested in how these films were sold but but this book was even a kind of deportation from that it was you're right there's a lot of difficult subjects and the longer version of the book which um you know I, I cut down significantly for the for the one that's coming to print had even more cases as well um it took me a while to kind of whittle it down um yeah hard hard material difficult material what would be your advice to say a young PhD student, say, or a young MA student, or even an undergraduate, because you know you you, teach, you work with undergrads. What would be your advice when pursuing this type of uh, topic on how to cope with it or how to? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guard think, their mental health. Say, yeah, I, mean, I think you have to be kind of, as with any kind of research, you have to be quite objective. I think, and, and try and maintain some level of, of of kind of detachment. I think that's the only way through it because it, it, the, these cases are so horrific. So every case that gets reported as, as snuff, you've got to kind of look at and say, well, does that really stand up? What are the details of it? You end up reading a lot of, of quite horrific Bad stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I think you've you've got a, I guess, hang on to the what it is that you're interested in, what's the golden thread that you're interested in exploring and, and trying to be as objective with, with that as you can and, and kind of get get through it, yeah. I'm wondering, well, has it made you more optimistic or less optimistic about humanity? Because I just read your book and I was like, oh, we're, we're awful, really, aren't we? <laughs> we're, we're not nice species at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I compress 50 years into a very kind of small period. Yeah, I mean, these are very extreme cases, aren't they? And I think you've got to think about it in those terms. These, The cases that I point to are, are, are the most extreme as a world that we've offered in the last... 50 years and I guess so the question is why aren't we doing it more why don't we do why aren't more of this happening yeah we're not so bad <laughs> yeah yeah so there's maybe something optimistic to take from that yeah because like I say we've we've democratised the, the modes of production we, we anyone can produce this now we've all got a video camera in our pockets so if you were so inclined you could produce this these kind of films so I guess that we haven't is something to be optimistic about maybe maybe I'm not sure. Yeah. Another question I, on that is, uh, <laughs> I'm not convinced, <laughs> but I'm an old fatalist, Mark, yeah, so don't yeah. worry about me. <laughs> the the uh, the other question I think is like, was there any point when you were researching it? Did you go? I have to. You do. Uh, you know. I have to stop. Did you ever go to yourself like, do you know what? I actually don't want to seek out this stuff on the dark web. Mm. You know, uh, it's just too much for me. Uh, do you worry that you you know you might miss out on something because the material is so horrendous that it goes you go you might go sub subconsciously I don't want to believe that this is the case I don't want to believe there's stuff that there's videos of uh, like the scully case of 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 uh, um of men streaming uh, the torture and abuse of uh, children yeah i mean the, that that was the without doubt the the most difficult part of the book that I had to research um yeah, the, the the Scully case for for anyone who's not familiar is a, a really horrendous case of of, of paedophilia by a, an Australian man who who filmed it, and he also claimed to have uh, have filmed the murder of a, an, another young child. The video never came to light, so obviously that that's why I had to deal with that element. But I I, I think when you get to to that kind of work, you know, the the sexual abuse of of young children, it's it's just harrowing. Um, yeah, I'm just pleased that's not my. That's your next project. I can see why your next project is on 
Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. It's quite a jump in a different direction, is it? Well, what's the, what is the topic? Uh, well, I, like you, I'm, I'm interested in myth. Um, and the the golden thread that connects all my work is myth. So snuff, I'm interested in the, the, the perpetuation of the snuff myth. The, the video nasties, I was interested in, in the perpetuation of uh, this sense of the di- the distributors as as kind of um, merchants of menace is what the, I think the Daily Mail called them. You know, the, the, this these kind of exploiters were actually they were just businessmen trying to make a living releasing horror films and um so it's kind of puncturing some of those myths and and similarly the stallone work that i'm doing now is a kind of a, a continuation of that so looking at the, the kind of sense of him he, he presents himself as as working class hero um rocky of course yeah yeah uh very it, self-made american yeah, yeah. and his, his biography is all about that Except he's not really. He was privately educated in a Swiss school. Did not know that. But yeah. So yeah, educated with the Shah of Iran's son and the heir to the Kimberley Did man. Did not know that either. Well, it's so, very much the American self-made man. Well, Rocky is like you know. He, yeah. You know, any 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 anyone can go yeah. the distance with the champ. And that's the thing. The studio didn't know how to sell Stallone. He was a relative unknown at that point. So you sell him by aligning him with the character and say, well, yeah, working class hero. So even so, someone in terms of myth then. What you know? What happens when the heroes get get old? When they become more mortal? You know, when you have, I mean, just before we came on air, when the producer just left the uh, the the the, the uh, no, I suppose ask the question then. Uh, why? What? What happens to these great heroes when they fall down? When they start to get weak? Like in the Irishman, when we when we mm. have to make. Uh, Robert, we have to sort of de-age Robert mm. De Niro and uh, Al Pacino. You know what's what's uh, what's what happens to the myth then? Well, I, I think does it become increasingly ridiculous? You know, like how many how many conscious and the stones do? I, I think it, it, for Stallone particularly, it's become increasingly valuable that narrative. So uh, the, the the narrative that, that is always told is about him fighting against the studios to get Rocky made, and they offer him X amount of money. Well, he wrote a script, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, and so well, I'm not I'm not prepared to do it for that. I've got a star in the film. So, no, no, we want to cast Robert Redford for this. You're not doing it. Uh, and he ends into this big debate. They, they finally agree that he can do it, but he's got a um, he's got to take a, a hefty pay cut. It's all fabricated by United Artists as a way to sell Stallone. But what's interesting is in 2006, when he's about to release Rocky, Rocky Balboa, that story comes into play again. But this time, it's about him not being able to get the film made because he's too old. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So this narrative of redundancy. So he, he mobilizes ideas of redundancy consistently. So Stallone is really interesting from that perspective. He can that that narrative always reinforces him as underdogs. So he will always succeed. You have, you can't fail with a narrative like that. Well, if you're a redundant, the biggest cure to redundancy is redemption. Yeah. Not sure about this uh, snuff stuff. I'm not sure if there's any redemption from that. That's that's, no. that's, that's grim stuff. <laughs> it is, but I mean, I, I think the the first half of the book, at least the the first third of the book, deals with with the film and and the kind of associations with the Manson family. And I think the film itself is is just a masterstroke of of marketing and branding. That's essentially what it is. It's it's perhaps the best marketed film, the cheapest advertising campaign, it's the most profitable in terms yeah. of. Uh, yeah, I mean, how many other films can you think of that that, that has had that kind of legacy? Really, I mean, we and we can't totally attribute the the, the prevalence of the snuff myth to that film, but I I believe, and I, and I try to document this through the book. You can see the the little moments of reverberation across culture as as different groups pick up on this idea, and and what they're describing is the narrative to the snuff film. They're not describing snuff; um, they're describing a fictional narrative. So. It's interesting, isn't it? It's like it's how the it's how the myth becomes interpolated. It's how we how we take up the myth and recycle the myth and recirculate yeah. the myth. Is there any counter myths to it? Do you think? Is there any? Do you think there's any <laughs> positive alternative to version of it that doesn't involve uh, cats? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is there a market for positive myths? Because if you think of positive myths, you know, it's we got tons of them. Like you know, we got mm. the young Stallone, the young Arnie. Yeah. We got Disney. Disney. Yeah. You know, I mean, Hollywood is the myth making factory. Yeah. But, that that idea of um, I'm I'm really interested in that idea of working class hero narratives. You see this a lot. This kind of you know, I've, I've, you know, self made men uh, scenario or self made women. 
Um, you see this in a lot of different areas. J.K. Rowling, uh, is all, you know, the story you see about her a lot is um, the kind of sense of her as a self-made woman about the, the, this single mom. single mom struggling, you know, and then becomes the biggest author in the world. Um, and it's not to say that these narratives aren't true, it's, but it's how they get mobilised. I think they become, they have a commercial value because yeah, we respond so well to those kind of narratives. Yeah, so we, we have uh, our redemptive myths as well as yeah. our myths of horror and evil. Yeah. So something a little more positive, I guess. We should probably stop there, should we? (laughs) Quit while we're ahead. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yep. God, I need to... (laughs) I don't know, Mark. (laughs) I need to uh, wash my head out with detergent after that. (laughs) Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark. That was absolutely fantastic. No, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) 